So what I want to do is now turn to this issue of, of, of neurotechnology. And what's very exciting is we're really at the edge of a field called neuro, uh, the development of a field called neurotechnology. And what I mean is, is that in our lifetimes and beyond, there's going to be a whole series of devices that attach to the nervous system inside the body or attach, go actually into the brain and interface with the nervous system. And they're going to profoundly change the way we can treat neurological diseases and the way we can restore function. We'll be able to, we can actually already restore hearing in many people, but restore vision or restore movement. And the story I want to tell you is about how we're working towards restore movement to people who are uh, unable to move. And the, the, the field is at actually a very immature state. And it's, it, there's a very good parallel to another field. The first cardiac pacemaker was a big clunky cart, lots of electronics, wires that went through the body and into the heart, and it shocked the person's heart, and that's how, that's how it made it work. That was 1950s. Only about a decade or so later, there was a little thing the size of a 50 cent piece that could go inside your chest, and millions of people have them. So neurotechnology is back over here, and keep in mind that sort of clunky cart idea, because that's, that's where we are today. So uh, what, is, what is neurotechnology? So what I, what I want you to see here, there's, there's a person here, and they're using a very nice uh, remote control for their TV. It's, a, it's actually on a little computer. And what they can do is by simply pointing and clicking with, the, with this uh, computer, they can control their television set. And you can see there's a cursor just like when you move your computer mouse, and you'll see a close-up in a second, that you can select a channel, you can select CNN or whatever network you yeah, want. Okay. And you can see the cursor moving. Okay. The only thing is, is that that cursor so Kathy, is not... So move it to another channel? That, that, that cursor isn't being controlled by somebody moving a mouse and pointing and clicking. That's being controlled directly from the brain part of the brain that ordinarily controls the arm. And that person is totally paralyzed. In fact, she, nine years ago, suffered a stroke in which she's unable to move her arms and her legs, and she can't even speak. So this is the only way she can communicate at all. She can't say, turn on the TV. So that's, that's a kind of neurotechnology. We've named it BrainGate. It's the gateway between the brain and the outside world that we're, uh, that we're working on. So why would you want to do something like this? Well, there's really actually a whole lot of people. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are unable to, to get their thoughts from the inside out. That is, uh, they have the ability to think about movement, but because their spinal cord is damaged, or their muscles don't work, or their nerves are damaged, they can't get to the outside world. They can't get their thoughts to the outside world. And, and this sort of little image over here is sort of the concept. There's a part of the brain up here called the motor cortex. There's a part that controls your arm. And its commands usually come down your spinal cord. And there's basically a bunch of wires called axons that come out. If those are cut by spinal cord injury, you can't get those signals out. And even though you're perfectly able to think clearly, lucidly, able to, to think about movement, you can't do it. So there's a big need for a lot of people. So the idea of this little concept is ordinarily when we move, you know, it goes from this motor cortex down the spinal cord, out to the nerves to your muscles, out to your hand, moves a computer mouse, and you get done what you do every day. You take it for granted this automatically works. But what what and paralyzed people, when these parts of the body are broken, we want to go directly from the part of the brain that controls movement out to get the cursor to move. So th this is really a monumental task. It's not something that anyone, at least I believe, any one person can do. And this is really one of the, one of the big steps in, in science today, is to build teams of people who can attack the various problems. This has engineering problems, has computer science, mathematical problems, and neuroscience problems, and clinical problems. And I've been very fortunate to work with this spectacular team that combines all of those, uh, of those attributes at Brown University, which is a place that is just wonderful to work and nurture these kinds of uh, interdisciplinary ideas. So there were a number of big challenges that we had to, to deal with in order to even come up with the concept of getting the, the, the stuff, the information, out of your brain and into, and, into the, uh, and, out, and into the outside world for people who are paralyzed. So the first thing is, is that we have to go after this signal up here, and I'll play it for you. So, so that little crackling noise is the sound of the electrical impulses from one brain cell. And right now, there are billions and billions of those things going on as you listen. And every part of your nervous system, this is the way your brain works, the way it communicates. And in fact, what neurophysiologists do is they spend their life trying to figure out what the heck those clicks mean. They're called spikes in the jargon, electrical spikes. And it's really how many of them happen in some time that's the unit of information. So the problem, there have been, for years it's been possible to get one out acutely in an animal, and even in sometimes in surgery, 
surgeons will pick up these signals to see what the brain is doing. But, but studying one brain cell at a time is sort of like saying, I want to know what IBM does, and I'm going to stick it, I'm going to stick it and grab one employee out, and I, pretend, I grab the mail carrier. Now I'm trying to decide, what does IBM do? Well, there's a thing that delivers mail. You know, so you get the wrong impression about what, what IBM does by selecting one. So we had to come up with a technology that allowed us to select many neurons. A really tough problem had never been done before. I actually went out and found uh, Dick Norman, who was developing this device, this little electrode array on the side here. It's about the size of a baby aspirin. And if you, if we, we took Dick's invention and made it into a device that could be chronically implanted in the brain, that is left in there, and pick up lots of neurons. It took about oh, 10 years of animal work to show that you could actually do this. But basically, that little array goes just into the surface of the brain. There are 100 hair-thin electrodes that pick up the brain's electrical impulses. And then it's taken to the outside by that little pedestal on the, that, that, that brings it to the outside. And the second big challenge, even if you have a technology that can pick up those crazy signals, is could you even make any sense out of those signals? The signals um, are very complex. But let me just give you a very simple example and turn you all into neurophysiologists that can decode brain signals. So imagine you're recording from one of my brain cells, and what I was doing is moving my hand to the left and to the right. And every time I move to the left, you got seven of those impulses coming out of the neuron. And every time I move to the right, you got two. Right? That's a brain code. Seven means left, two means right. So tomorrow you come back and you listen into my brain cell and you hear seven. Which way did I move? Left. Good. You're a decoder. That's neurophysiology decoding. So the problem is, is, of course, the brain doesn't work quite that simply and it doesn't always fire the same way. And so we have to use some complex math and algorithms to average lots of cells together. But lo and behold, we can actually read out of the brain what you want to do with your hand. So given that we did that, we had to find a way to prove a principle that you could actually show that all this worked together. So this is my other life as basically circus trainer. We taught monkeys how to play video games. The video game here, in this case, there's a yellow dot that's a target. And the monkey's job is to play with the mouse, hit the, hit the yellow dot. And uh, when, he, when he did that, uh, we were recording his brain activity. And we built a map between what his hand was doing and what the brain was doing. And my student, Misha Soroya, then unplugged the mouse, went straight from the brain. And here you see the green cursor is controlled by the monkey's brain, thinking about how he wants to move the cursor. But he isn't actually moving his hand at all. And he's playing this video game of moving the green dot to the red dot, simply by using, uh, simply by using brain activity. So that took us to about uh, 2000, well, really into 2001. We were, we were pulling all of this together. And we said, this is a remarkable opportunity to take this kind of technology and help people who can't move. And somewhat naively at that time, we, we, but, but I think with hindsight was a great step forward, we decided that what we need to do is form a company because we can raise the huge amount of capital it would require to take this thing from an academic lab and translate it into a real product. And we founded uh, the, the company called Cyberkinetics. And here, the state of Rhode Island played a very big role because the Slater Foundation, which is a seed, seed agency to, to help small companies like ours, uh, gave us a loan of $75,000, which we repaid very quickly. And, and uh, uh, we, we started Cyberkinetics. We then went out and sought venture capital funding. We got funding from uh, Oxford Bioscience, who was uh, Mark Carthy, was very forward looking, saw the, the vision of all of this, and was very helpful. And I think the seminal event was hiring a terrific CEO, Tim Surgener, in 2003, which I see as the time when we really began to take off. We actually spent a year and more than $6 million, so that our first patient was literally the $6 million man, putting all of this together to uh, get FDA approval and uh, start a clinical trial. We put a device together that was very much like what I just showed you. It had that same brain sensor, the brain interface, and then a series of electronics that took the brain signals on the outside. And just like that clunky card in the, in the cardiac pacemaker, it translated the brain activity and basically showed the person's own thoughts about moving the hand as a cursor on a screen. So this was the concept. We got FDA approval to start a trial. Uh, we now have uh, studied four participants with spinal cord injury who can't move their arms and legs, and a couple of other folks who have other diseases, like a stroke or ALS, where they not only can't move their arms and legs, they can't even speak. They can't communicate at all. So what, what could? Was the first one the stroke victim? The, the, the person I showed at the beginning was a stroke victim. And I'll show you several videos. And uh -huh. this actually will come from, I'll show you a video of, of what, uh, what she can do. Uh -huh. But I'll also show you, Matthew Nagel has actually achieved sort of national fame. In July, he was on the cover of Nature magazine right. as we published our work. 
Uh, and he's been quite vocal about speaking to the world. Um, but but let, me, let me just tell you, so the, the, the first big issue was that is there any brain activity at all in a person who's had you know, three to 10 years out from their injury? Maybe the brain just gets quiet. So for us, it was really a big deal. So here it is, here's human brain activity that you're listening to, that crackling noise is coming from the brain. But not only is it coming from the brain, it's that change in the brain activity is coming from her thinking about imagining moving her wrist. She can't do it, she can imagine it. And every time that little green light goes on on the side, we told her to imagine it. And you can hear the crackling, very nicely correlated. So the first demonstration, or one of the early demonstrations, that merely just thinking about movement is enough to get the part of your brain that ordinarily controls movement to get going. So this, was, this is you know, extraordinarily exciting to us that, that in fact the brain is still working, still going. And we were actually able to build a decoding filter. And here's Matthew Nagel, our first patient, was completely locked in, uh, completely unable to move his arms and legs. And he's playing a video game uh, with, it, with simply his brain. So he's like, like the monkey was, using the, controlling that cursor merely by imagining moving his arm. And Matthew was a gambler. He likes to gamble a lot. So we use money bags to motivate him to really go directly to the target. And, and actually, one of the things, the struggles we've had is you can see that if you had a computer mouse that behaved like that, it's not great. And so in our early patients, one of the things we discovered is the quality of the control is a little wobbly. It doesn't stay still. And, it, and, and you'll see in a few minutes, one of the great things about you know, our collaborative team is the, the folks at Brown have actually turned that into a much better control signal by getting the data back to our university and where we can really work on it. So I, here's Matthew. Uh, and I just wanted to, first I think you can get a, an impression of, of his life. He's sitting in a chair. He's got a ventilator that's make, that allows him to breathe. You can see the connector from our, our pedestal connector that takes the signals to the outside. And here Matthew's operating an interface. Uh, this is a, uh, an email program. And so he just sweeps the cursor over the email. And you can see him open an email and let him talk for himself. So he's reading the email. Great. Now, can you exit back to the cybernetic desktop? Exit. So uh, he, he was able to control the cursor and, and, and run sort of computer programs. We had him control a, a TV set and things like that. In addition, we actually uh, decided, said, you know, given we were shocked that, you know, he could do so well. So we said, let's set up some demos really quick and see what he can control. So here we just borrowed a robotic hand, a prosthetic hand from Liberating Technologies. And here he is uh, just looking at the hand. And he learned very quickly to look at it. And he was actually controlling this hand again. So you can imagine an amputee someday that we could now hook up their arm to, this, to, this, uh, to their brain again and have them control it. And I'll let, if, we, if it loops around one time, you can. So <laughs> I think that captures, but that's really important. And one of the wonderful things here is, is we actually have captured the essence of of what happens when, when, you know, this was raw f footage right off the very first time he did it. And he couldn't believe that he was actually controlling something again, having uh, not moved anything for three years. So in addition, we got this little robotic kit. And so he sort of did a pick and place. And he was able to very quickly learn to use a robotic arm. Again, sort of a, a demo. And I won't play the whole video up. But he could actually grab this piece of candy. And his job was to drop this into uh, Misha Soroy as the student's hand. And in fact, Misha promptly dropped the piece of candy so um, we've actually made, the, so, so Matthew's videos are a couple of years old now, or about a year old. And now uh, we've made some significant progress. And here what you're seeing is uh, the, the person with stroke who's unable to speak, unable to communicate, uh, using a, a really terrific new software interface, now to take the brain interface and hook it up to a software interface and allow her to communicate again. So she's using the spelling board. And you can see that just by placing the, the cursor over the letter, which she's doing neurally, and she can now point and click. We've actually managed to use the neural activity to get her to point and click. And I asked her the question, what do you think of this technology? And uh, so this is actually her first opportunity to say something. That is, to think something, have it spelled out, and actually have you say it. And I'll let you listen in. So the software, actually, you'll see above. When she gets close to spelling something, it guesses at what she's trying to spell, and she can select the word. 
So I asked her, what do you think of the technology? And you can see the cursor, although it's a little slow, uh, it, it's, uh, it's actually much more stable in its control, and she's very accurate at placing it. I love it. So that was her first ability to actually verbally communicate uh, from, from the outside. And one of the other things that's really rewarding about this, this person was very depressed because she was sitting in this horrible state for years, and now she's actually laughing and enjoying it. So that part is actually a very rewarding part of this translation from the, from the laboratory into real human settings. So this is not ready for prime time yet. There's a lot of work left to do. Is it still the clunky cart stage? We need to reduce all those electronics into something that could be fully inside your body. Again, fortunately, we're working with uh, Arturo Nermico's lab and with people at, at Cyberkinetics to take and reduce the whole thing into uh, packages that can be implanted inside the body. And here's the first prototype that's actually going to be tested this fall in which electronics that would occupy something the size of a cigar box are now down to something the size of a penny that would be fully inside. And we, what we'll see is that there'll be communication around the body via fiber optic networks that will translate thoughts and bring them back from the body back even to the muscles again to make, par uh, make it possible to move again. So here's a vision for the future where I believe that there are going to be all kinds of devices that attach to the nervous system. BrainGate is one of them in which we'll be able to allow communication. We're actually working to take the BrainGate signal and hook it up back to the muscles so people can actually move again. That's about five years away for the very first trials of that. But imagine even a technology where this kind of brain sensor can pick up activity from the brain of an epileptic and report to them an hour in advance that they're going to have a seizure. We can see that, that then they say, pull off the road, take your medicine, those kinds of things. Or better yet, it delivers medicine to the brain and you never even know you we're going to have a seizure. So the idea is that all this technology is going to restore normal level of life. It's a ways off, but it's going to come pretty quickly, I think, and that's what's so exciting about all this, this, uh, the, this development of this dawn of this age of neurotechnology. So with that, I'll just say, say thanks, and I think my time is up.